The media had a field day with what was going on in the United States because, let's see here, we got Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. So two banks in the U.S., they're having issues, and now people get worried worldwide. Did you get those phone calls from your clients? How do you respond to it? What's going on, Zach? Is the sky falling? Uh, the sky falling. The sky was falling in the states for a very, very brief period of time. Um, it fell a lot, so I don't blame people for worrying. Um, you know, there was definitely there was definitely a reason for concern. Um, I'm not getting the calls simply because what's going on in the states. While you know conceptually it's a, it's applicable here, um, it hasn't happened, and I don't think it's going to happen. Um, just because the way that. Canadian banks are regulated versus the way they are in the States. Um, you know, first and foremost. Uh, and second of all, I just think, you know, I think Canada in one sense may be more resilient. Um, and in another, the, the the fact that we don't have banks necessarily on a provincial level, we, we do in some respect, but, you know, the majority, the vast majority of people in Canada bank um, with the big six, which are all federally regulated banks. In the United States, it's a little different. Um, what you're seeing and what a lot of people were seeing were state-run banks getting into trouble. Um, none of the federal-run banks were, you know, experiencing too much difficulty. And so, because they're regulated differently, they're just there was there was a differentiation in how they were affected, you know, over the last month. And so, um, I'm not worried about it. It's not going to happen here. What happened to explain it to everybody is it's actually quite simple. Um, Banks run mainly on confidence. Really, that's that's really the best way to explain it. When people have confidence in banks, they will uh, they'll give their money to banks as deposits, or they will lend from banks in forms of loans. Um, and what those banks will do is they'll take people's deposits, and then just like you know any one of us, the banks have places to deposit their money to. What they'll do is they'll deposit with the federal run banks or the provincially run banks. Um, and from that, they will get their form of security and their form of security for their deposit is often bonds. Uh, bonds are debentures. They're essentially loans from one entity to another. So if you know Bank A lends to the federal bank, or, or sorry, gives a, a million dollars in deposits to the federal bank, well, the federal bank will give a million dollars in bonds back saying, you know, at the time, at the end of your investment, we'll give you your million dollars back and we'll give you a little bit of interest here and there, right? The problem was, uh, well, one of the problems was that because interest rates have been hiking and hiking and hiking so much over the last couple of years, the interest rate that the federal banks were paying the regional banks, the provincial banks or the state run banks for the US examples was so low that it was devaluing the bonds. And what that means is bonds that were worth once a million bucks are now worth, you know, $850,000. Um, now, why is that important to consumers, to the people that are lending to the banks? Well, if you put your money in a bank and you give them a million bucks, you expect them to give you back a million bucks. Okay. Be nice. Well, what happens if the banks can't do that because what they invested in isn't worth a million bucks anymore, right? Now, are banks, you know, are they mandated to have certain reserves? Yes. Are they mandated by the types of investments they can make? Yes. Um, but what happened was because so many people lost confidence in the banks saying, you know, I'm not so sure that my money's safe there, they're going to start taking their money out and where they're going to hide it under the mattress in the backyard, you know, wherever it may be, right? But it means that they're taking money out of the bank. And no bank holds, for instance, you know, a billion dollars of cash on deposit, right? That A, it's a security, massive security risk. And B, they want their money to work for them too. So when you have, you know, their the consumers, the investors going up to the banks and saying, Hey, we want our we want our billion bucks back. Like, give it to us now. And they say, Well, sorry, we don't have it. Then everybody really gets scared, saying, Oh my God, you don't have the money. Oh my God, you don't have the money. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And now everybody wants their money back because they think the bank's going down and that causes the bank to go down. So it's just a snowball effect. Um, and it it's, it's what we call a bank run. And unfortunately that happened in the States because they don't have the greatest forms of regulation for state run banks. Um, and on top of that with interest rates and the forms of assets and the companies 
that were investing in these banks. Um, it just, it was a, a whole recipe for disaster, which tons of people saw was going to happen and nobody did anything about it, which, you know, was an idiocy to me, but um, in Canada, we have ways to prevent that. We have um, much stricter regulation. So it, can it happen? Yes. Will it? I don't think so. Is there a strong likelihood something like this happens? No, it's easily pre preventable. So I go put $10,000 in, let's say, CIBC, okay? Mm -hmm. Does CIBC take that money and it's part of, let's say, you go to apply to CIBC for a mortgage for a house. Are they using my $10,000 towards your mortgage? Oh, yeah. They're going to give me like five hundred grand for the mortgage. But in your five hundred, dollars my ten dollars might be in there? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Your 10 will be in there. Somebody else's 10 will be in there. Somebody else's 10 will be in there. There's a multiplier effect. So when a bank receives a deposit, they know that based off of uh, with based off of withdrawal trends, they know that they can have maybe five times the amount of money loaned out that they have in deposits because they know nobody's going to need that money or they won't want that. money. So a lot of their money will be held in loans to said people, whatever it is, right? So there's there's strict math that goes into it. It's math I did in university that I really don't want to do again. Um, but yes, that's what they're doing. How is that not a Ponzi scheme then? That they're taking someone person's money and investing it and then giving back from somebody else's money. Isn't it to some degree? I, to some degree, I can see why you're saying that. Mm -hmm. But it's not a Ponzi scheme simply just because of the tiered lending and the regulations that require them to make sure that they have liquidity and assets available should you want it back. Like I always thought, for example, let's say a whole town woke up one day, right? No matter yeah. what province you are in Canada, so we'll use Canada because they have a different banking than the US, but the whole town wakes up one day, they all line up at their banks and they're like, okay, we change our minds, give us back all our money. If every single person did that, Bank is SOL, I would guess, because go ahead and go to almost any branch and try to take $10,000 out. They don't have it. It's amazing. You know how you watch those movies and you break into the safe overnight, like you're able to go through the roof, through the HVAC system, you short out the alarm system. I've watched it all. I know even if you have to tie, uh, you know, chains to the uh, bank safe itself and have a truck pull the, the safe out and drive around with the safe around and watch Fast and Furious. Uh, Great movie. When you get that thing open, it's going to be full of money. But you go here into banks in, uh, at least in Ontario, and you're lucky if they got a couple thousand bucks lying around. So if you're going to be a bank robber, you're not going to have a very good profession out here. So where where is the money, Zach? If they're not able to give us money, if you stand in line and say, hey, I want some money today. Oh, no, you got to pre-order that money. Where's that money sitting? It's a good question. So, uh, and, and and you gave a really good example too. And in your example, you know, you referenced that the banks would be SOL, but the reality is, is the banks aren't the ones who are going to be SOL completely. It's actually the people who are going to get the money from the bank, the depositors, they're the ones who are SOL because they're going to come and say, we want our money. And the banks are going to say, too bad, we don't have it. Uh, so, you know, they're really the ones who are in trouble the most. Um, where does the money go? So, um, you know, for, and every bank will tell you this, for security purposes, we do not hold that much liquid uh, cash on site. So, you know, they see somebody go rob a bank and there's like 5 million bucks in the vault and they're like, oh boy, just know that bank is doing about 100 million a day in, in cash on cash. So that five or 6 million, it maybe sound like a lot, but in the grand scheme of things for the banks, it's nothing. Not to mention they have to maintain the reserves. So if you do need a lot of money and actual physical cash from a bank, more often than not, you're going to have to actually do an order far in advance. The money is being held in secure facilities and in securities. That's just the way it works. Because our system is so technologically integrated between banks, um, you know, depositors ourselves, like credit cards, for instance, how often does somebody actually touch cash these days, right? You know, 20 years ago, cash was king. You'd see people walking around with wads of money in their pocket. Right now, it's just tap here, tap here, online payment here, online payment here. So the need for physical cash has been reduced so much and people are using the technology to pay for it. Most physical cash is being held in reserves in secure locations, some government locations and some locations owned by banks. So you don't have, you're not privy to these locations if we hypothetically wanted to plan a Fast and Furious heist. 
I can neither confirm nor deny that I'm privy to the locations. Somebody brought up a very good point to me the other day, actually. Um, to be clear, they are not a drug dealer or drug runner that I'm aware of, but I think they're a very big fan of the show Narcos. And they're mm-hmm. saying, you think about Narcos and, you know, they have all the money and they're all like, you know, wrapped up really well and hidden, etc. When we go to a moneyless system, like a paper moneyless system, so everything's going to be virtual money, how are they going to be exchanging these monies for drugs? Are they going to be using like... Uh, um, uh, like USB keys, like it's it's interesting Crypto. of where it's gonna go, but it, it that's what, like saying that tongue in cheek, obviously. But the other thing is like the conspiracy theories goes of why they're gonna go to a uh, virtual money system is because it's gonna get rid of a lot of the underground uh, businesses where people are taking cash, 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 cash. All of a sudden, when it's tap, 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 guess what? Th- there's traceability all of a sudden. So. Somebody's thinking of something out there. Isn't it interesting too that that the blockchain was created and the cryptocurrency marketplace was created, and the people who utilized it most were the under was the underground market, right? Like for people who don't understand it, crypto assets are definitely valuable for some respect. Okay, a lot of people are investing in and out, but the most valuable form of crypto assets are for criminals. And, and it's, you know, go read any study done, look it up um, on governments tracking money on governments, um, you know, forcing certain crypto exchanges to give them their records um, on, you know, Canadian transactions, you'll see that it is a criminal underworld there. And so I just find it funny that the, that the structure and the blockchain in itself used for the criminal underworld is what's going to be the sword that kills the criminal underworld's form of money movements. I don't think we'll ever go to a completely paperless society just because there's, there is an income class of people that just can't afford to pay banking fees have debit cards, credit cards, things like that, you know, don't have the technological means or understanding to do that. So there's still going to be cash in society. But, uh, you know, the whole cash of society is it's definitely scary for some some people. Um, you know, I love listening to the conspiracy theorists as well, because, you know, for every statement, they say that you just scratch your head, there's something actually relevant in there. And you think, wow, that actually may be a good point. So uh you know, it'll be interesting to see where the world goes in that respect. I can tell you, I very rarely touch paper money myself. It just doesn't come up. You get paid electronically, you pay bills electronically. There's no need to pull out money. So we'll see. I th- I still think in my lifetime, I'm planning to live to about 120, 130. So I think I'm still going to see it, but uh, you never, never know. Now, the people that did have their deposits in Silicon Valley Bank and at Signature Bank, uh, are they sleeping better tonight as far as you know, Zach? No. No, it's, it's they're still... sleeping better. They're sleeping better than they did three weeks ago. But no, the the concern with that and the federal government has said that they're going to back deposits for certain banks in the, the U.S. federal government. I believe it when I see it kind of situation. Yes. Um, and we'll see if they actually need to do that in the end. But, you know, most banks have uh, insurable deposit amounts, right? So for Canada, we have the Canadian Deposit Insurance Corporation, CDIC, which will uh, insure your deposits up to 100 grand. So for anybody out there who's got deposits of more than 100 grand with certain banks, diversify. You know, that's definitely one thing to do. Um, Go to five or 10 different banks and have 100 grand at each one if you're a wealthy person and have that. Don't have a million bucks with one bank. Um, anyways, in the States, they have insurable amounts of 250 grand. The problem is, is that the people who are using Silicon Valley bank are tech giants. They have like, I don't know, $500 million on deposits. So their 250 is nothing. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I can't tell you that they're sleeping better at night, but I think that they're certainly not sleeping and trying to figure it out. 